here at Center United Methodist Church, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in this beautiful, beautiful morning. And it's good to see all of your faces and to hear all of your voices once again. I had to put on dress shoes this morning. <laughs> And a robe, too. And a robe, too. <laughs> yeah, I, I, no, I, I, next time I'm wearing my shorts outside, because I promise you, it's, it's warm. Make sure I wasn't visioning anything. Well, even the warm socks with the bees on. Oh, God. We've got a few announcements to begin us this morning. Uh, most of this is in your bulletin already. I have in there that. June 12th, which is this upcoming Saturday, is going to be our first free produce stand. Uh, we talked it over yesterday and decided to put it off one more week, um, just with all the funky weather, things aren't quite growing as fast as we hoped it would. So, um, not this Saturday, but the next Saturday will be our first free produce stand. Next Sunday, June 13th, that's our administrative board meeting at 5 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, May wants to remind everyone that lay person of the year nominations are available. Now, um, if you have any nominations for lay person of the year, get that to May by August first. Our uh, garden volunteer hours—we moved it up an hour. Uh, we'll start at nine o'clock on Tuesdays and Saturdays, just trying to meet people a little bit better. And then on June eighteenth, in a couple weeks, I will finally be ordained uh, fully as an elder in the United Methodist Church. I want to thank everyone here for all of your support and assure you that you have been much more supportive than the conference has. So thank you for, for being with me through all of this. Uh, Jenny, you want to go ahead? Hey. I've got a few announcements as well. The UNW um, usually recognize high school graduates and babies on youth Sundays, so we're sticking with tradition this year. This morning at the nine o'clock service, we, we have three high school graduates, Angie, Sandra, Vance Hearn, and Fisher Do, and Angie and Vance were recognized at the 9 o'clock service. Haven't heard back from Fisher, so if he's available, we'll recognize him. But they all graduated from Southern League. Is that it, Southern League? Mm -hmm. um, Friday night on the 4th. And also we have three babies that we're gonna recognize. Uh, two were recognized this morning at the 9 o'clock service. Olivia Grace Chesley is the daughter of Elizabeth and Chad Chesley. She was born on December 18th, which was Anne's birthday from 2020. Um, and also Andrew Charles Workhauser was born on January 11th of um, 21. He's the son of Amber and Philip Workhauser. He has a big brother, Elijah. Both of these babies' grandparents are David and Missy Dykus, and their great-grandparents are Al and Joanne Brown. Neither one of the babies were here this morning, David accepted for them. And we do have a baby here this morning, I'm very proud of this baby, who's a part of my family, Jaden Alexander Campbell. He was born November 22nd of 20. He's the son of Chelsea Hall and Chaffee Campbell. His grandparents are Richard and Pam Hall, and his great grandparent is Lucille Hall. So um, Chaffee Campbell, I mean, uh, Jane had not come forward to get this. So would y'all mind walking this forward? It's a little gift card from you, Becky. Everybody can see this in the face. It's a happy day. He likes the lights. Thank you. Thank you, Janet, and we are very um, thrilled with, with the babies and thrilled with those that graduated. It was good seeing uh, a couple of our graduates at the 9 o'clock service, and, and I gather there was some cute confusion. There is still and will continue to be a 9 o'clock service outside, and um, it was a good time. We all, instead of sitting in the cars, we all got together and, and um, didn't even have to use the microphones. We were able to, to hear one another, and so I encourage you, if you're up early and you want to come out for the 9 o'clock service, um, make it a part of your school. A great time. Are there any other announcements? Anything I have missed? <coughs> we missed being here. Yeah. <laughs> but not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and Jerry, it's good to see that you got your day off, too. 
Well, we'll go ahead and I'll ask Ralph if he will um, play a quiet call to worship on the piano while we draw ourselves to Christ.
Our Psalter this morning is Psalm 138. We pray this Psalter um, with me leading in the boat. Sorry, me leading with the regular print, and all of you responding together with the boat print. Again, number 853, Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I call, you answered me. Your strength in my life. All the rulers of the earth shall praise you, O Lord. For they have heard the words of your mouth. And they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. For the Lord is high, but regards the lowly. Yet knows the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies. And your right hand delivers me. O Lord, fulfill your purpose for me. O Lord, may your steadfast love endure forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Amen. Please be seated. It is good to, to be gathered together once again in this way. Uh, it's been good to be gathered throughout this year. We found different ways to do it. And, uh, had to change things up and be flexible. I was uh, speaking with a few pastors earlier this week, and, and it's been um, quite a year. It's been quite an amazing year. Um, it's been interesting to me uh, hearing some of their stories. And one I was talking to said they had transitioned to an outside service and had uh, twice the folks coming to the outside service than they ever had coming to the inside service. So they're going to keep on doing that. Um, but I was talking to another one who, who was sharing about this past year and how. Um, how rough it was on his congregation, having had many of them um, weren't, weren't happy with all the restrictions that they had in place. And then um, two of his church members actually passed from COVID. And as, as tragic as that was, it made me thankful that we have not had that here. Um, we have come through this time, I'd say, with flying colors. We've found new ways of doing things. We have not diminished our mission to the community around us. So I'm thankful as we once again resume uh, this worship practice, I'm thankful for, um, for you, for the, the um, presence that, that you've enabled this church to have throughout this past year. What about you? What are you thankful for this morning? Rain. Rain. For having a big group of people here. Yeah. Six of us here. <laughs> You able to hear everyone's voices when they sing? Yeah. Hey, for my great grandchild. Yeah. End of the school year. <laughs> <laughs> Still dancing on it. <laughs> I know a few teachers that are. It was funny, um, we got Lucy's end of school year report from her teacher, and they sent it out you know, three or four times a year. And every other one, the teacher wrote a whole lot, and this one's just like two sentences. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else I would thank you for? I had a few prayer requests. Uh, we're glad to see Larry and Joyce here. Um, Larry was telling me earlier that his uh, medication is working. So he's got a couple more weeks of that, and then he returns to the doctor again. And Joyce is uh, up and moving, but as long as, as Things go well. Larry, she'll be facing back surgery of her own. Um, July, or so. Um, also heard uh, Wanda was sharing her sister, Faith Clark. We've been praying for it. They, they diagnosed her with um, problems with the liver, and she is up the road at um, Westfield. Westfield. Um, and, and things aren't looking um, great for her. So I want to keep the family of Jennifer Minter in our prayers. That's Kathy's niece and Holly's only first cousin. Uh, and of course, keep all those in our prayers who um, still cannot get out, cannot be around others, or are still um, homebound and isolated. Got a couple that came in uh, this morning. Charlene sent me an email asking prayers for your granddaughter. Brandy. 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 
I want to say Brenda, I knew that wasn't right. Brandy, um, who's facing all sorts of uh, medical issues. Uh, I, I gather she's been facing these for a while now. I also ask that you keep my stepsister, Amy, in your prayers. Uh, she was taken to the hospital late Friday night and um, retaining fluid around her lungs and in her feet and ankles, and they're, they're not sure why. They're just kind of treating um, a variety of things right now, so we're throwing, a, throwing things on the dartboard and seeing what sticks. So we pray for that. Any other prayer requests this morning? Ben Kennedy's in the hospital. Yes. All right, we'll go before the Lord in prayer. As always, I will lead us in prayer and we'll provide times of quiet. And I encourage you to lift a lot of those names and situations that are on your hearts. Let's pray. Father, it is good to be here in your presence. It is good to be together with those that you have called, those that you have drawn unto yourself. Lord, we thank you for all the goodness that you've given to us. We thankful, thank you for the bounty of this earth, the bounty of this church. We thank you that throughout everything, you have remained faithful and true to us. As we enter into your house this morning with thankfulness, we also enter with sorrow, knowing that our sins stand between us. And yet you have overcome those sins. You have sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And so we may enter free. Lord, forgive us for our sins. Not only the sins that we readily admit, Lord, forgive us for the sins that we keep hidden deep down inside. Forgive us for the sins that we refuse to acknowledge as sins, those things that we now call good that remain evil in your sight. Lord, by your grace and by the power of your Holy Spirit, guide us now as we pause in silence. Help us to examine our hearts, to confess to you, and to repent truly, not only in words, but in changed lives. Thank you for your grace that frees us and redeems us and sustains us. May your grace abound in our lives and in our church. And through our lives and our church, may your grace abound in this world around us, that we may be vessels of your grace and mercy, that we may be declarers of your good news and builders of your kingdom. We pray for the ministries of this church and of other churches that we may all work together hand in hand for the building up of your kingdom and our own. We pray for all of your children wherever they are this morning, however they are gathered. May they know your grace and your peace. We lift up those who are hurting today. We pray for the physically ill, those who are facing surgeries and treatments, those who are uh, facing ongoing problems. We pray for those who are told that they will not recover. We lift up the mentally ill, the bipolar, the borderline, the depressed, the anxious, the schizophrenic, and so many more. We pray for those who are hurting in their hearts, those who are grieving and filled with sorrow, those who are alone and isolated. We ask that you would heal bodies, minds, and hearts. We also ask that you would heal our relationships. We pray that you will help us to give forgiveness as freely and easily as you do. We ask for healing in our families and homes and in our friendships with one another. Heal our church and our community. Heal our state, our nation, and our world. Lord, be with all those who remain in our hearts in this moment. <clears throat> Thank you for hearing our prayers and for answering them. Lord, you have proven yourself true and trustworthy over and over and over again. And so we lay all of our burdens at your feet and we praise your name because you are worthy of all praise. 
And we join together with one another and with all the saints, praying the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. You know, this morning uh, when I got here, there is a, a letter waiting for me from the conference uh, thanking Center Church for our uh, continued support financially. Uh, this past year, we made 100% of what's called our apportionments. That's what we pay to the denomination. And I know that that's not the case for a lot of churches. Um, this, this past year, as I said, it's been hard in a lot of places. Um, and again, because of the faithfulness of its members, Center Church has been able to continue in ministry. And so I, first off, I need a couple of volunteers who can be ushers for me, if you would. I can wait. <laughs> I got Matt and Newell. Um, as they come forward, I just want to remind you that you know, we're, we're not giving to keep lights on in the pastor's favor. We're giving to expand the kingdom of God. And so I encourage you to give out of God's abundance, to give out of faithfulness and obedience to the Lord, and to give to the building up of his kingdom. Thank you. 
Now you may be seated. Our scripture this morning is from 1 Samuel. We'll be looking at chapter 8, verses 4 through 22. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us, like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people and all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them, just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So also they are doing me. Now then, listen to their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots, and to be his horsemen, and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands, and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground, and to reap his harvest, and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves, the best of your cattle and donkeys, and put them to his work. He will take one tenth of your flocks, and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, we are determined to have a king over us, so we may also be like other nations, and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel had heard the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, Listen to their voice, and set a king over them. Samuel then said to the people of Israel, Each of you return home. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Holy Spirit, you are here among us. Speak to all of us and speak to each of us. That we may be changed not only by the hearing of your word, but by his kingdom. In Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. I don't think that we study the Old Testament as much as we ought to in most churches. A lot of pastors that I've known preach nearly exclusively out of the New Testament. And often we reserve Old Testament stories for children's Sunday school classes. We have those nice flannel boards and little paper cutouts. Stories of David and Goliath and Daniel and the lion's den. We do a great disservice to ourselves and to our churches by ignoring the Old Testament. Aside from being the foundation that the New Testament is built upon, and aside from being the very start of God's self-revelation to us, the Old Testament is very relevant to us. You see, here in the Old Testament, we have the story of God's dealings with and redemptive work for a very stubborn and willful and disobedient and hard-headed people that demand to get their own way all the time. People that are like us. And so today's passage starts with some of these stubborn, willful, disobedient, hard-headed people coming to Samuel and demanding that they get their own way. We're going to spend uh, several weeks working our way through 1st and 2nd Samuel and the 1st Kings. But today we're kind of dropped in the middle of this story. 
And so it helps us to backtrack a little bit. And let's start with Samuel. Samuel's one of those characters that, again, we learn about in Sunday school, but maybe you've forgotten some things about him. Samuel is the last judge of Israel. Now, Moses was called, led by God, to go into Egypt and lead the people out of Egypt and across the Red Sea, and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And after Moses came Joshua, and Joshua led the people into the Promised Land, and they conquered it, and they settled it. And following Joshua, we entered what's called the Time of the Judges. See, the nation of Israel was not exactly a nation like we tend to think of today. The nation of Israel had no central government. They had no one ruler. They had no sort of capital building. They didn't even have a centralized place of worship. The nation of Israel was composed of 12 tribes that were sort of confederated together. They were led, each tribe, individually by tribal leaders and tribal councils, but they didn't really work as a whole unit together. Not unless they felt like it. The only thing that really united these two, or these 12 tribes together were the laws that God had given them. What we today refer to as the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And they were expected to just keep those laws and live in that land. Now this arrangement lasted for about 300 years, and it was a rough 300 years. See, when the people entered the promised land, God made a covenant with them. As long as they lived there and they obeyed his commandments, God would protect them. They would never be invaded. They would never be conquered. And they would never serve as slaves like they had done in Egypt. And over this 300-year period, they were constantly invaded and conquered and served as slaves to foreign kings. But the reason is because they didn't obey God. They didn't follow the commandments. And whenever this happened, God would raise up what's called a judge, a leader, to lead the people of Israel not only in military ways to get free of those foreign kings and powers, but to lead them in a revival, to return them to the ways of the Lord. Often these judges uh, had a, a prophetic role. And the judge would come in, would be raised up by the Lord, the people would be restored to Israel, and then years later the judge would pass and the people would return to their own. And Samuel was the last of this line, the last judge. Now, Samuel had been a judge in Israel for years and years and years. If you remember his story, he was dedicated to the Lord as a child. He heard God's voice calling him in the night. He was a prophet. He was a leader. He would sit in judgment of Israel. People would come to him and he would weigh on their cases. And he even reached one point where he led them in the military way. As an army of Philistines came in to invade. Samuel took on that role of general and led the people in fighting off their enemies. He has been in this position for years. He is a proven prophet of the Lord. He is a righteous man. He is a decorated war veteran. He is a man deserving all honor and respect. And so the people come to him and they say, look, man, you're old. Maybe they had a point. Samuel knew he was old. This was not a surprise to him. His body felt the years just as surely as whoever groaned a minute ago when y'all stood up. <laughs> he knew he was old. He knew that he was slowing down. He actually had assigned his two sons to be judges not in his place, but under him. They would take on leadership roles and handle kind of the day-to-day -day stuff, and he would handle the big stuff. But Samuel's sons weren't Samuel. And he knew it, and everyone else knew it too. They didn't walk the same paths of righteousness that Samuel did. They didn't have that same prophetic gift that Samuel had. And so the people came to him with a legitimate complaint. You're not going to be able to judge us forever, and your sons, they can't replace you. Samuel didn't argue at that point with them. He understood. But then they went on. 
Instead of your sons being judges, anoint a king for us so that we can be like the other nations. And that's where the trouble started. Israel had had a rough 300 years, that's true. And they looked around them and saw that other nations had kings. Kings who would lead their armies to victory. Kings who would keep them safe and defended and protected. And even kings who would go out and lead the armies and conquer in other lands. And in bringing back the riches and the power and the slaves and the livestock and the cattle from these other lands. And the people wanted if they had a king, then they wouldn't be under that constant threat from the other kingdoms. If they had a king, then he could go out and fight for them, and when trouble came along, they wouldn't have to raise up a militia. If they had a king, they might just get a share of that bounty when they went out and conquered others. And so they shouted for Samuel, give us a king that we can be like other nations, and the king can fight our battles for us. The problem with that is that this is a violation of the covenant that God had made with them. From the beginning, God established himself as the king. He is the one that decreed the laws. He was also the one that provided the protection. And God, in giving the law, told the people of Israel over and over and over, you will be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Now that word holy actually means something that's set apart, something that's different, something that is reserved for a special purpose, for service of the Lord. And so he told the Israelites, you're going to be set apart. You are going to be different. You are my people. You are reserved for my special service. Be holy. But now the people say, well, we want to be like the other nations. And God has already told them, as long as you obey, you will not be invaded. I will fight these battles for you. I will keep you safe. But here they've been invaded over and over and over. Not because God failed them, but because they failed God. And so they demanded a king. Give us a king so that he can protect us and we can do whatever we want. We don't have to follow those laws. So Samuel hears the people's demand. And he knows it for the wickedness that it is. And he brings his concerns to the Lord. And the Lord tells him, I know. I've heard what they're saying. But Samuel, they're not rejecting you. It's nothing personal against you. They're rejecting me. Just like they've always done. It's amazing how often we find ourselves rejecting God. Repeatedly, God calls us to Him. God calls us to be obedient. God calls us to be holy, to be set apart, to be different, reserved for special service to Him. And when things go wrong, we're very quick to go running to God, to cry out for His help, to make promises that we have every intention of keeping until things get better, and then those promises just don't seem to mean a whole lot anymore. They are rejecting me, as they have always done, the Lord says. And so he sends Samuel back to the people with the instructions. Listen to them. Do this thing that they're asking for. Anoint them a king. But first, give them a warning. Tell them what a king is going to be like. A king will make demands of you. He will take away your children, your sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters. He will take your crops. He will take your livestock. He will take your food and your drink. He will take your money and your land and your home and your property. 
The king will live in lavish luxury, and you will be his slaves. So Samuel gives them the warning. He asks, is this the kind of king that you want? And the people say, yes. Why do we do that? Why are we so quick to latch on to the promises of protection and prosperity that leaders make in our lives? Leaders in our government, leaders in our community, leaders in our workplaces, even leaders in our church. We quickly latch on to these promises that say you won't have to do anything but just reap the benefits. We know it's not true. We know that these, lie, these promises are just lies, that they're hollow. We've been warned and we've seen it happen over and over and over again, yet we fall for it every time. We will have a king of our own choosing. Samuel warns the people. They say, we don't care. We will have a king of our own choosing. And so they do. Samuel anoints Saul to be king over them. He has an okay job at first. But he does exactly what Samuel says he was going to do. And then the king after Saul came along, and he did exactly what Samuel said he would do. The king after him came along and did exactly what Samuel said he would do. The king after that, the king after that, the king after that. Every king has been like that. With one exception. There's one king that never took anything from others. One king who kept every promise that he made. One king who offered true freedom instead of slavery. One king who came not to be served, but to do the serving. And he's not the king that we chose for ourselves. Rather, God sent us a king. His only begotten son, Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior, the king of kings. Throughout human history, every king, every ruler of humankind, except the one, has acted out of self-interest and has wrung the riches out of his people. But Jesus wrung the water out of the washcloth and washed his people's feet. Throughout human history, every king, every human leader, except one, has trodden on the backs and crushed others under his feet out of self-interest and a quest for power. But Jesus reached out and touched the leper and the blind and the crippled and the poor and the orphan and the widow and the imprisoned and the lonely. And he raised them up. Every king, every ruler of humankind except one has threatened and intimidated and endangered those who refuse to fall in line and obey. But Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Every king, every ruler of humankind except one has feasted at a lavish table filled with food gained by the sweat, tears, and blood of his servants. But Jesus has provided a feast for his servants. Food gained by the sweat, tears, and blood of his brother. Jesus has invited every man, woman, and child to his table. To a meal of never-ending bread and wine made of his own body and blood. So do you want that kind of a king? Or will you continue to reject God? To deny the holiness that God is offering to you? And continue to demand your own ways and a king of your own choosing so you can be like the rest of the world? Ultimately, the choice is yours. But Christ has invited us to his table. Our king has set a banquet for us. 
I invite you to follow along on page 12. So see, Christ our Lord invites to his table all, all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, who seek to live in peace with God and each other. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We do have failed to be in the meeting of church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Pray us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Here are the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right. And a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of the suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. Deliver us from slavery, sin, and death, and may with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Christ Jesus. We offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ, Christ is dying, Christ, Christ is risen, Christ, 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 Christ will come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ. One way to other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast this heavenly man. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The body of Christ was broken for you. And the blood of Christ was shed for you. The Lord's table is made ready. The invitation is given. This invitation is for all. I do ask for a volunteer to help me serve the juice. Down. Yeah, thank you. We'll start uh, with Ralph and Jana serving them, and then as Ralph plays, you're invited to come forward row by row. Neil at the altar, you'll be given a piece of the bread and offered a cup of juice.
king has invited you to feast at his royal table. Go forth, declaring him to be your king in all of this. Amen. <laughs> Stand as you are able to prepare ourselves for going into this world by singing our final hymn, number 378. Amazing.
receive this language. Go forth with Christ as your choosing to walk in his ways every day, declaring his kingdom open to everyone. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.